provází život na Zemi a člověk... It accompanies life on Earth, and people could not exist on this planet without it. Both precious and common, animate and inanimate, continuously lost and irreplaceable. This is soil. There are few things which everybody knows as intimately as soil, and yet it is far from easy to define it, and even less easy to know and understand it. What do we know about soil today? And how do we handle this knowledge? How do people look after this skin of Mother Earth, the geoderma? It may seem inert and always the same, yet appearances can be deceptive. It has taken thousands of years to develop, and it keeps evolving. One look below the surface shows us that soil was formed by rock transformation and the parent material through the long-term impact of water, changes in temperature, and other environmental factors. Soil, a single word, yet what a variety of forms, colors and textures or smells it encompasses. This diversity reflects the variety of environments and conditions in which soil was formed. And yet, local conditions or climate alone will not form soil. Let us take a look below its surface and together decipher what makes it our provider. Would you believe it that below me, right under my feet, there are more organisms than the number of people inhabiting our planet. Billions of individuals and hundreds of thousands of species of all shapes and sizes. These organisms live in tiny spaces between soil particles. Many other, even smaller organisms, inhabit soil water, which adheres to soil particles like a thin film or fills some spaces. There are so many, and so close to us, and yet, hardly anybody has seen them properly. Life is a vital factor which helps create soil. Soil abounds with it. On the surface, immediately below it, as well as deep down, soil itself is a complex living organ of our planet. For plants, soil is a source of nutrients, support, as well as substrate. Whether we speak of a forest, a meadow, or cultural plants which we grow in fields, they could not grow without soil. The most fascinating soil function, which cannot be conceived without its living component, is related to the ability of soil to dispose of the decaying bodies of all organisms, the dead biomass. It never ceases to amaze me to see how much mass nature is capable of producing just by itself. It does not really matter whether we are in valleys or in the mountains, on slopes or on flat ground. It could be said that soil works as an automatic device for biomass production. Depending on the climate, nutrient availability, and the amount of water, Nature can produce up to dozens of tons of living biomass per a single hectare. The most fertile soils in our country can be found in lowlands, in the alluvia of large rivers. No wonder that most biomass is formed there. In some places, such as the floodplain of the confluence of the Morava and Deer rivers, one can almost get lost in the herb layer. Just look at the incredible volume of plant biomass around us. Unbelievable! Some nettles must be over two and a half meters tall. Let us come back to this same spot after winter, in early spring. In a mere six months, a huge amount of green mass which we saw then has disappeared. Only these fragments have been left. It is visible that the organic matter is disintegrating. It is the work of numerous tiny organisms.
Fresh biomass serves as food for herbivores, among them many insect species. Although they inhabit above-ground ecosystems and live outside soil, they still contribute to its formation. Some insect species may break out and virtually destroy the living plant biomass of their hosts. By feeding on them, they transform plant mass into excrements, which end up on the soil surface as part of the soil organic matter. Similarly, their dead bodies find their way to the soil later. Large herbivores, both wild and bred by humans, are also important for the formation and functioning of soil. The matter produced by this pasture comes back to the soil, to the natural cycle, either because the grass dries up and decomposes, or through the digestive system of herbivores, whose excrements stay where they were formed. A number of insect species, for example beetles, flies and their larvae, use these excrements as a food source and thus help return organic matter back to the soil. This is a beautiful close-up of dozens of holes. It is a proof that insects do get inside. Yeah, this is a dung beetle which forms little balls from the matter and places them in underground tunnels for its larvae to feed on. Dung beetles and scarabs are capable of transporting the balls to different places. Apart from excrements, animal carcasses are also very rich in energy, and that is why scavenger insects take them by storm. However, Predatory animals which feed on scavenger larvae get their money's worth as well. Decomposed bodies of animals will in turn enrich soil. The food source for soil organisms and forests comes mainly in the form of leaf litter. Depending on the decomposition rate, it either disappears entirely in the course of the year or forms the layer of forest litter. The forest floor may look like a mere pile of dry leaves, yet is an environment abounding with life. How is it possible that organic matter decomposes on the soil surface? When we scoop a handful of soil or place a dry leaf on top of it, nothing visible happens. The soil will not bite us or eat us away, and yet decay is taking place. It is a very slow process. When we take a really close look at the soil surface, things begin to become clear. This is already decomposed. The leaves are fragmented, and the deeper we go, we reach the surface of mineral soil. This is what it looks like then. These are roots. Each of these environments, be it the leaves on the surface, or the much moister leaves in the detritus, below it, in this entire layer, or here in the mineral soil, each of them provides habitat for different groups of animals, which adapt to these environments. Each of these organisms plays their role in organic matter decay. Bacteria do the most important work in soil. 
They can adapt to the available supply and therefore can be found almost everywhere. And in return for the energy necessary for their survival, they will decompose virtually anything. Nutrients produced through decay then return back to the soil. Fungi work in a similar way. Unlike bacteria, some fungal filaments, or the commonly known mushrooms, can be seen with the naked eye. Fungal filaments on plant roots provide otherwise unavailable nutrients in return for energy-rich substances. This symbiotic relationship between plants and fungi is called mycorrhiza. The vast majority of fungi are microscopic and live on decomposing biomass. In order to see them, we must sample the culture. This is what has grown in the Petri dishes over the past week. These microscopic fungi do all the work in the soil. Kilometers of fungal filaments grow in the soil, and this is the way how to take a close look at them. Just look at these colors and shapes. The world of fungi is bizarre and fascinating. This is how their cultures grow during laboratory cultivation. However, the picture is different in forest litter. Fungal filaments appear to walk onto the fallen leaves, and in a similar manner, they grow through soil, even deep down. Fungi and bacteria decompose organic matter by getting on it and then starting growing. The speed of decay is therefore conditioned by the size of surface which is available. Let us imagine that this block of butter represents dead organic matter, and these sweets are fungal filaments and bacteria. They gradually cover and then grow over the surface available on the organic matter. The process of decomposition has started. When we cut through the block to form several smaller parts, the surface increases and decomposition can become faster. This is exactly what hundreds of tiny animals are doing in the soil. They break off tiny fragments of organic matter with their mandibles, or calicera, and through this activity, break it down into even smaller bits with an increasingly larger surface, which can be colonized by bacteria or fungi. This process takes place not only on the soil surface, but also deep inside the soil. Organic matter travels down, particularly thanks to earthworm activity. They burrow long corridors, and they not only feed on dead leaves, but also drag them from the surface to their tunnels, and thus mix it with soil, where bacteria and fungi decompose leaves faster. Their abilities, as well as their importance for soil, were admired by Charles Darwin. They are true soil engineers. Ants also drag their prey and plant fragments into the soil, thus contributing to their decomposition. Millipedes and wood lice can be seen with the naked eye. By feeding on dead biomass, they both break it down and create large amounts of lumpy droppings, which in turn become part of the soil humus and significantly enhance the formation of soil structure. A similar role is played by frequently abundant and bizarre insect larvae, mostly those of different flies and crane flies. Upon reaching maturity, they leave the soil and become a part of the above ground communities. However, when we take a closer look at even smaller animals in the soil, their species diversity can easily match that of the best African safari. 
The world of soil creepy crawlies is full of creatures less than a millimeter in size. Springtails are among the most abundant. Even the most ordinary forest soil houses dozens of species. A special fork-like contraption at the end of their tails enables springtails to jump and to run quite fast. They are among the first to colonize freshly dead organic matter. Larger species inhabit the soil surface, leaf litter or moss. They tend to be colorful, have long antennae, and their bodies covered with shiny scales and hairs. Deeper in the soil, color doesn't make much sense, and size tends to be an obstacle. The tiniest white soil species measure only around two-tenths of a millimeter. Most soil mites rank among oribitid mites, whose bodies are protected against drying up and also against predator attacks by a hard armor with spikes and protuberances. They resemble many armor-plated fighters. This oribitid resembles a walking lump of soil. Molts of previous instars with grains of soil glued to the back protect it from drying up and serve as a perfect disguise. A female can carry its eggs on its back to make sure that its offspring hatch in a place where she finds food. However, the lump on its back also contains fungal spores which she can use to disperse to the newly colonized detritus. She can then feast on this newly created garden. However, the soil safari takes us further afield than just springtails and oribitid mites. Detritus and dead cell content provide food for protuberans or coneheads which have no antennae and used reinforced front legs instead. Their presence is an indicator of the good quality of a soil environment. Fast diplurans with a pair of cerci on their abdomen look as if they had antennae on both ends of their bodies. The antler-like antennae of graceful, soil-dwelling blind poropods serve as a perfect white stick which enables them to smell and taste as well. White Anki triads are smaller relatives of earthworms. It is not length, but body diameter, which matters when it comes to moving in soil. They are capable of moving through soil pores, just like springtails and mites. Soil is home to minuscule snail species, some of which have nearly transparent bodies. What a breathtaking world. This incredibly rich animal community is much too tempting a bite to be left alone. Just like the African savanna has its lions and cheetahs, soil has its ferocious and fast predators as well. The role of predators is to regulate the number of soil decomposers and consequently the speed of decomposition. Just like elsewhere, the local predators have long legs, sharp senses, and mouth organs well equipped to hunt. Predatory mites are much faster than the clumsy oribitids. Predators dwelling deeper in soil lack pigment and their bodies are covered with numerous sensory hairs. Forest litter and soil surface are home to larger predators. From the beetle community, we can find smaller ground beetles or rove beetles with shorter litera. Spiders include species which are minuscule, as well as well-recognizable species, which we can see with the naked eye.
Pseudoscorpions are highly exotic animals with pincers at the end of their large pedipalps, resembling bigger scorpions from the tropical and subtropical regions. Fast and flexible centipedes also rank among large soil predators. Flat japigids tend to scour the soil surface or forest litter, while the long and slender soil centipedes have adapted to the deep soil conditions. It is this never-ending and perfectly self-regulatory swarming which ensures that we do not drown in piles of dead biomass. Without decomposition, we would run out of nutrients, which would not return back to the soil for further use. This is what I call sustainable production. It holds true both ways. There will be no soil without soil organisms and there will be no soil organisms without soil and dead organic matter. They would have no energy necessary for their survival. Man is no exception. We also gain energy by consuming other organisms. We replaced native plant growth with what represents the best food for us. It is hard to believe it, but detritus such as fallen leaves, dead roots or wood, as well as animal excrements or even carcasses, are the same delicacy to soil organisms as a crispy goose is to us. But let us go back to the field for a while. Try to put yourselves in the shoes of a soil creepy crawly, which has to work really hard in this environment to be rewarded with a juicy and energy-rich meal. People cultivate soil in fields to enhance production. However, when seen from the perspective of soil organisms, we get a different picture. First, plowing turns their houses upside down, and then they have to endure repeated rains of chemicals or inedible mineral fertilizers. Added to that, vehicles pound the soil to the point that it is virtually impenetrable. All these hardships could be outweighed by increased production of biomass, which bears the promise of lots of life-bearing energy. But people eventually collect everything and take it away. Crops from the fields, as well as timber from the forests, to eat, to build from, and more and more frequently to get energy from. It's not hard to notice that biomass is missing in the fields. The tempting vision of a rich source of livelihood is shredded to pieces by us. Our best allies that have kept soil in good shape for millions of years are left to scramble for food in vain and starve. They have no other option than to run away or die. The microscopic organisms are forced to dig in the long-term supplies of soil humus. But this is how soil starts feeding on itself and its structure starts collapsing. Farmers and foresters have been aware of this for some time. Keeping organic matter for the soil and in the soil is critical for both its quality and fertility. We know how to do it. Fertilizing by manure has been about for thousands of years. Yet, organic matter must be replenished in other ways as well, by leaving more remnants for the soil or through the production of cash crops which are not taken away from the fields. Only then will geoderma, the skin of our planet, remain a living and life-giving structure for years to come. An old Czech proverb says, feed the cow and it will fill your stoop. The same holds true for soil. We may try to feed it this way, but it will probably not help much. We must not forget this. Organic matter is fuel for the soil, and no one, let alone soil, will dry far with an empty tank. We must not let it starve to death.